11, 1996 for the Women's Studies Oral History Project. We will begin by asking Mrs. Stevens to repeat her full name and the organizations she's affiliated with. My name is Kathleen George Steiner Stevens, and I am regent of the General James Jackson Chapter, Daughters of the American Revolution. Uh, I'm serving my second year as regent. I am past regent of the United Daughters of the Confederacy, of Austin Chapter number 471. I am interested in these organizations because uh, I am a sort of a history buff and I am also a real estate broker and all these uh, researches that I do take me to the courthouse and it fits well with uh, together with my real estate and my genealogy societies. And uh, I've been in DAR since 1982 and uh, just a great group to belong with, and the ladies are all cooperative. Did you become involved in um, uh, these organizations through your interest in genealogy? Yes, but, and also uh, because there were so few people still living that were aware of the history of, of our families, and it seemed that I should take part and uh, help my own children and grandchildren to have something they can refer to, the written word. That's nice. Uh, have you done a lot of, of genealogical research as a part of these organizations? Yes, I am, um, I have served six years as the registrar for DAR, All Daughters of American Revolution, and it is quite uh, difficult to uh, research in you not only find the name of the person who fought in the war of the Revolutionary War, but you have to find their records of where they were and who they married and when they married. And it's just on and on. And I think you can go to 12 generations uh, before the current people would have found all of their ancestors. And then you have to document everything to the national headquarters and they then prove everything that you have put on the paper. And if it's not right, then you have to research further. Uh, the two organizations are among the oldest uh, in Valdosta. Only Lima is uh, older than the United Daughters of the Confederacy. Um, but your membership is relatively new. <laughs> it is, but I've been aware of all these organizations, but my family, the race in my family, did not allow me to meet. And they usually met around 3.30 in the afternoon. And that was the very midst of my children's um, activity. I know that they are organizations that have made significant contributions to Bound Boston. Uh, could you tell us a little about uh, the things the um, uh, DAR has done? The DAR and the UDC and Wyoming Dice sort of roll into one when it comes to some of the activities. Now, the United Daughters of the Confederacy, I'm answering before, it all was responsible for the uh, Confederate monument being placed at the Fort House Square in 1911. The DAR has um, helped to, uh, the three groups helped to, or did build the Woman's Building in 1925. It was completed, but there were a lot of plans that had to be done by the DAR regent, the UDC president, 
to get this on the way. And it is there now. As it has been all these years, being used by the members, and when not used by the members, it was rented to others for their benefit. At one time, it was in fact rented to Valdosta State. Right. <laughs> That's true. It was not Valdosta State then, but it is now Valdosta mm -hmm. State University. But it seemed that the dining hall at a college at that time burned, and for a year or so, it was used uh, for, of the dining hall for the college. You have lived in Valdosta since you were a little girl. Yes. Um, would you like to comment on some of the changes that you've seen in the city? There have been many changes. Oh, I thought about one change that has been so beneficial for the city is to have a city recreation program. Uh, back in 1939, when things were sort of uh, right after the Depression, and the Depression was really still for a lot of people, uh, they had a community um, building that they rented the city did this, and my mother served as uh, the person who taught the children handicraft. And in the summer, they would go to the college and around the pool, and then what was the book store then, uh, they would uh, have their lessons in uh, needle craft, crocheting, and uh, basket weaving, and that sort of thing. So it, it has really emerged since then. It has really gotten to be uh, something for everybody. There are swimming pools now that were not then, except the college, we had these college pools. One out in the country called Barber's Pool that some of the children use, but basically the city children use the college pool during the summer. Uh, That's one thing, paved streets too, <laughs> it's a, a big paved streets, paved alleys. Oh, it's helped a lot over the years to give us more fabulous space. <laughs> uh, you have described um, some cooperation between the college and um, the people of Mount Austin, and I think one of the distinguishing characteristics of our school is that we have gotten along rather well. Um, that includes the willingness of people to sit through interviews like this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, there is a good rapport between the, the university now, college then, and it's several name changes, of it, but it's always been a, a good rapport. And uh, we have a military base close by, and I made a plug for Valdosta. There's a good rapport there as well. Is there anything you would like to say to those people who will be viewing this tape in the future? Well, uh, I think that uh, Valdosta has come a long way since the, the, the college has become now university. The organizations that were begun long ago are still in, uh, in activity and they cover a lot of territory. They do a lot of uh, work for children, uh, for, for our fresh and clothes for um, the migrants who come here. And two of our members have spent thousands of hours teaching the migrants English. And some of them go to the doctor with them to translate. And those are our DAR members. With them is. Thank you very much for your cooperation. Uh, in it's been a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Let me hit the pause button. Fine. Stop. Tom. Oh, now, can you review that? We can look at it. Can't do it. No, I can't. Um, this you. isn't. This is a cheapy camera. Okay. Some of them you can. Some of them you can't. But not this one. Um, I think I sort of skip around too much and not even ask the same no, question no. you asked me. Answer it. That's fine. Um, Okay, we're stopped, and I need to go eject. It is not ejected. Why are you not ejected? Last word. Rewind pause. Did you get, did you get that? Oh, this, yeah, this is this. Okay. And it's got the cameras on, and I hit record.
This is what happened last time. It took it, my it's tape. It's open and the tape is not there. No, because I've got it hooked up. Here. Okay. It's the tape's on this All side. All right. Okay. All right. Let's go. This is an interview with Dr. William Gabbard for the Women's Studies Oral History Project, March 12, 1996. We will begin the interview by asking Dr. Gabbard to repeat his full name and give his credentials. I'm William Montgomery Gabbard. I was born in 1922, now 73 and a half years old. I was a graduate of the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, where I majored in history. I received my master's at Northwestern University, where I held a graduate assistantship. I then later received my doctorate in history from Tulane University, where again I held a graduate fellowship. When did you come to VSU? I came to VSU in 1948, just after uh, getting my master's from Northwestern University. I did not know what I wanted to do, but I finally decided I wanted to teach, and I will have to mm -hmm. tell you that I had one other job offer. It was $2,200 a year. This one paid $2,700 <laughs> for nine months. I was delighted to accept, and I came with the idea of staying two years because you were then taught that if you stayed two years that showed you were asked back after mm -hmm. your first year. So that was a must on your record that you had stayed at each place two years. That was my original intent. I stayed 40. <laughs> <laughs> what did you teach here? I came as an assistant professor of history and I taught every phase of history to talk. Western Civ courses, the American history, and the Georgia history course. And I had never been to Georgia until I got here. But I always said I thought I did better in that perhaps than I did in other fields because I diligently pursued the area and I've enjoyed it. I've traveled all over Georgia through the years, even the little byways and off the highways, so I know much more about that than I do my native state of Tennessee. Uh, you eventually became head of the Department of History. Yes, I became uh, head of the History Department, I think it was 1960, because I remained head, or perhaps it was a little earlier than that. I remained head of that, I think, for 15 years before I consulted with Dr. Walter Martin mm -hmm. for over the advisability of mm -hmm. establishing a Department of International Studies, which I did, and I think that began, it did in 1983. So I was, for 15 years, I was Director of uh, International Studies before I retired in 1988. Uh, I remember that one of the things that you did as Director of International Studies was to establish very good relations with the people in town uh, mm -hmm. through a series of, of dinners following speakers that were brought yes. on campus. Yes, I uh, had, uh, and I think that was in 1976 when I first started it, the Spring Focus Series, we called it, and I was able to attract a number of very well-known people here, from ambassadors, Dean Rusk, and numerous people who came in, experts in their various fields, and we focused upon a particular country. I did a lot in the Asian field because I had, and I neglected to say in my postdoctoral work, I held uh, a number of graduate, postgraduate rather, fellowships at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, Duke, University of Texas at Arlington, Columbia University, University of Chicago, <laughs> and uh, well, some others, I mm -hmm. think, that I can't even remember. In, in, uh, in Asia, too, I had some in India that I uh, held there. So this gave me a much broader focus, and I will go back and say, that what prompted me to establish the International Studies Program was that I realized here we were in the middle of an economy which was in the world market, cotton, tobacco, peanuts, and yet here we were without the vision to 
see what's going on in the rest of the world. And I think it was very uh, a positive accomplishment in seeing that. I took a number of groups to India too, multicultural understanding programs, I call them, where they, when we had just uh, integrated with blacks. And uh, I took the proportion of blacks in this area in the group, and then the others were white. And we studied a third culture while studying ourselves, doing introspection. I think it was extraordinarily successful, really, that field. Well, you have certainly seen a lot of changes here. When you came, in fact, this was a woman's college. Indeed it was. It was Georgia State Woman's College. Mm -hmm. At the time, it was very confusing because at Millersville, there was a Georgia State College for women. And there were the two women's, co women's colleges that we had. And ours was W-O-M-A-N-S. That's what it was uh, spelled. Mm -hmm. When I came, there were fewer than 400 young ladies here. They had just gone through a phase of a, of a school, which the late Frank Reed, established and it was sort of a finishing school along with a very, very fine academic record. Mm -hmm. And just to mention, they had had horseback riding up until the year before I came. They had that, they had a lot of things that, uh, well, the nice young ladies did in those days. And at the same time, what impressed me most when I came, besides the very friendly added atmosphere here, was the excellent academic standards that they had. And I'd already heard about girls who were going on to med school. That mm -hmm. impressed me because very, very few women ever went to med school. They spoke of other graduates who had gone on in the theater, in various fields, biology, one of the graduates, Elsie Quarterman, later became chairman of the biology department at Vanderbilt University. So I thought this must be a very good school to have produced some of the people they're talking about. They had very committed, dedicated uh, professors here, most of whom were women. And uh, I had had no problem working with women, enjoyed them very much, and uh, had many, many good friends. Uh, many of them were department heads. And they were all, though, extremely dedicated to their work, working with students and they received very little monetary compensation, relatively speaking, in those days. So they, uh, but they, they did, were dedicated to the idea of turning out good graduates, and this they did. That was the most impressive thing to me, was the extraordinarily good academic standards, which were in effect here at the time I came. And there was a, a sort of an esprit de corps, let's hold on to these, let's keep them up. And if anyone showed signs of being too easy, uh, they were sort of uh, given them, they were ostracized a little and brought back into line. I can remember even much later after I came in the 50s, we had some very good students here, but I had a class of 32 in a freshman history class, and I had 14 A's and B's in the class, and I was really I felt compelled to go to explain to Dr. Durenberger, the academic dean, that this was not a result of being easy. I just happened to have a grouping of exceptionally good students. And that's the way we looked at things then. Uh, it was across the board. You could not go and get somebody easy. You, everybody maintained the same standards. And these young ladies, the girls, as they at that time, were very, very committed themselves. First year I came, there were 185 freshmen. A wonderful class, which entered with me in 1948. They graduated in 1952. This group had the first four-point graduate in the history of the college. That was 1952. The college had been in existence for a number of years, but that was the first time anybody ever made four points. I knew the girl well. She was attractive, she was a beautiful swimmer. She did everything well in dramatics and was an exceptionally good student. Another girl who visited me this past fall was a biology and chemistry major. She became a doctor, is a radiologist now at MD Anderson, full professor at MD Anderson Cancer Hospital in Houston, Texas. She told me that she was one of two 
medical college graduates, when she graduated medical college after finishing here in 52, and only two out of 80. And I think that shows you that the school could have people of that caliber and send them on. So they, we were known. I'll say in later years, I taught a number of lawyers, future lawyers. And uh, through that aid, I worked with them. I sent students to uh, graduate school at the University of North Carolina. One of my students went on there and got a Fulbright University of Paris. I know people and a lot of uh, law students who went on. So we did try to prepare and to make our school known to the largest schools to show that we too could offer quality education. Well, you have been here... Uh, 40 years. 48 40. years now. Since oh. Came. Yeah, it is going. Okay. I was going to say, don't look down. It's not um, You've seen the school integrated uh, yes. with males and with blacks. Correct. Uh, how do you remember those changes? All right. When we became a co-educational institution, and as we call it, Little Emory out here, which mm -hmm. was a division of Emory University, it was with some mixed feelings, and I'll have to say in retrospect that we did attract at that time a less than uh, average, probably, type of young man. There was, the ratio was about one to ten for boys to girls at that mm -hmm. time. And although the, some of them were very good, we did have a number of people who had flunked out at various other places and who were hoping to find a home somewhere. Mm -hmm. And a sense they came in, and I remember this quite well because we, the school here stressed leadership for the young ladies, mm -hmm. and they performed beautifully in all fields and athletics and drama, music, uh, the entire range of activities on the college campus, mm -hmm. the dance, and there was a tendency at that time for boys mm -hmm. to come in, they wanted to be president of the clubs, mm -hmm. things of that sort. I do remember that. And they were not exceptionally well qualified as well. There was, in a sense, a lowering of standards to a degree. I quite well remember that this school, so it was said, though I could not prove it, along with Agnes Scott, had the highest standards for people in the state, other than Georgia Tech and uh, that is the women's colleges, and on a number of occasions, I remember hearing people say, boys and girls, that they were going up to the University of Georgia to build up their grade point average, because uh, they couldn't do it here. Uh, they, were, they were called here if you were not good in something, that was the way it was. But the thing that impressed me about the school at the time when I came in, they, the girls still dressed for Dumma once a week on Thursday night. Then there were such things, uh, traditions, as the Old English Festival, which they dressed up and uh, for this Old English Festival and threw the U log on the fire and so forth and had the, the pig that, that served and so forth with the apple in his mouth. And then that was in the ones, and then in the spring they had the uh, May Day Play Day, which the be beautiful May Day celebration with Queen and the court. And they had it down on the south end of the campus, which was a very beautiful place. And the, the dance club, they had a first-rate modern dance group in there. They just really did. I'd come from Northwestern, so I thought, well, I guess this is a little small school. Mm -hmm. I was gratified to find that the director of drama was Louise Sawyer, graduate of Northwestern, whose productions were superb. They really were. Likewise, in the modern dance, a person of unbelievable ability and ingenuity and creativity of that record. And you could apply that to so many other uh, fields, the people who were strictly academic. But in their fields, they were regimented, they were dedicated, and uh, everyone held the students' feet to the fire, so to speak. It was a delightful teaching arrangement. I didn't realize until later how lucky I was. It was small enough where I you could not cut classes without a specific excuse. So you had a captive audience. And if you had that, if they were there, 
then, and you imposed your regimen upon them, you could have a very good class. And you did. You could inspire them, and they, they responded quite well. It was a delightful teaching assignment that I had. Well, you've certainly seen us grow, uh, both in numbers of students and outward into the community. Mm -hmm. uh, would you like to comment on that growth? Well, we've had tremendous uh, growth numerically. No doubt about that. I think it's 9,500 now that we have enrolled here. I look at it from two ways. At the time I came, society then did not expect every high school graduate to go to college. They did, those who could afford to did, and there were a lot who were unable to afford to come. I will comment on one thing. I think this college had a very nice arrangement then. It took those people who were, we said in those days, a little slow intellectually, mm -hmm. and I guess through testing they did it, but they would have two sections of a certain class. We'll say it's History 101. Well, they had it 101A. The A section did not stand for academic excellence, mm -hmm. but rather for a slower group, mm -hmm. but it was a it was a way of trying to take those students from weaker backgrounds and to bring them up to the level. Mm -hmm. And I think it worked to some degree, at least in that stage. But at any rate, my overall impression of the college, and this is true in all universities, that we do not have the same academic standards today that we had in the old days, and there are a number of reasons for it that most of us are fully aware of. But uh, I regret that we don't have that same emphasis upon the academic rather than upon numbers. I think, uh, I don't think bigness always means better. I think you can have quality and be small. And that's what impressed me when I came here. I thought a little tiny school with fewer than 400 people, well, it must not be much. Well, I found out that it was a quite a well-known institution, and it made its mark, although small, through sending these girls to uh, professional schools, to graduate schools. I remember that first year, we had a girl graduate who went to the University of Pennsylvania uh, graduate school in anthropology, who did quite well. So you see, they were, they were well prepared when they went mm -hmm. to uh, do that. But then the, the integration of blacks, which I heartily endorse, it came about, and it was not exactly easy, but it did come about, and uh, that's when in the 70s I began to take these groups, as I say, to India, multicultural understanding groups, to study one another, and I think they were very successful. I regret and lament that today, from what I hear, that academic standards are not what they were in the old days. But then that's true, I'm told, at many other universities and leading universities at that. I'll tell you this, there's a commentary on that right here in this living room that uh, a professor of history at Princeton University, the Arthur Link, who is the leading biographer of Woodrow Wilson and so forth, and Arthur told me that uh, he had a student, a doctoral student at Princeton, who simply could not write. And Arthur was of the old school. He says, you will learn to write. You will come to my house every Saturday morning and sit at the kitchen table. He made the person write. He would correct it, write it again, kept writing. So I commented, I said, Arthur, I presume that student was a minority. Said, no, it was not. So I think that gives you an idea that even Princeton mm -hmm. University had doctoral candidates who could mm -hmm. not write with. That's the lament I hear from, uh, in my last years at least, all over. I had people who told me, Brand Moore and various others, and they said that they didn't have freshman English courses because that is supposed to know how to write. But they said, unfortunately, when you signed the term paper, they didn't know how to write. So. I, I guess overall that, uh, and yet I know that education is a more democratic uh, 
phenomenon today. We are reaching out. We reach out in many different ways. Uh, when I came, this was strictly a liberal arts college. They had one person to teach education courses, but there was not a department of education. You got your degree in a departmental major, but with the proviso that you could teach. You had the requisite number of uh, professional education courses, but you did not major in education. For that reason, everyone took uh, divisional majors, humanities, you had to have so much in the humanities, so much in the sci sciences, so much in the social sciences. There was no escape. You could not have an easy degree here. Tell me a little about your fellow professors at that time. Um, I know that there were some remarkable women who taught there. I would be glad to. Very good friends. I can name them. As I say, uh, Louise Sawyer, who was professor of speech, who was a delightful person, charming, mm -hmm. and who produced plays. And I look back, she had no budget for staging. Uh, she would borrow chairs from somebody, a sofa from somebody. There was no fancy uh, equipment such as we now have. So a volunteer person would come in and do the lighting. But the quality of her plays were phenomenal. And the students had a very high respect for her. I remember her production of the Aries was just first rate. I saw it on Broadway last year. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was just struck by the uh, remembering how well it was done here. All right, Louis Sawyer was one. I can mm -hmm. name another, B. Nevins, Beatrice Nevins, who was head of the biology department and uh, served with distinction. She, also in the same department, was Marjorie Carter, who, and they had this idea at the time, which I thought was very good, Marge Carter was house mother, as they called it, of the mm -hmm. dormitory. At the same time, she ta taught part-time. She later taught full-time. But that was the idea that she would be on the, since most of the students were boarding students, she was there to be a mother confessor, but an advisor, not only of personal matters, mm -hmm. she was very good at that, but in academic matters. So that was the concept that they had at that time and some of the people, and that, that's the way they did it, whereas the three dormitories they had. Well, she was a, a person very committed and uh, to the field of biology. Then there was Dr. Sapolo Trena, a superb scholar, a person of an old family in Georgia who, Phi Beta Kappa, who had, uh, who taught French, Spanish, and by all accounts, the girls reported very mm -hmm. rigid in mm -hmm. her demands. And I always remember this, I thought it was amusing. There would be sometimes an advanced class, maybe three or four girls in a senior French class, perhaps. She would go around the ask question in the morning, Miss Jones, this, they wouldn't know it. When she finished up with the four, instead of saying, well, well you don't know yours, she started over. And she went round and round, and they said it never happened again. They were always prepared. So that showed you some of the rigidity which we had, but it mm -hmm. produced very, very good students in that respect. She was a first-rate scholar. We had, um, at that time, we had Mrs. John Jenkins, who was Dean of Women, a wonderful person who came here from the University of Georgia who taught, charming person, brilliant intellectually, delightful personality and who at the same time could entertain with a flair and did things very beautifully. So those were some of the women. Now there was Mildred Price who headed the uh, history department who had been here for some time. And some of these ladies, I'll have to tell you a little humorous, they were always a little hesitant about their ages. And if anything came up, there were these vague when I came here in 1492, things like that. <laughs> but that didn't deter students who would always go back and look in the annuals and see when they really came. So they could sort of guess the ages. But then, uh, so that was some of some of the women who were here at that time. Uh, Tilly Mathis taught, uh, along with uh, Leonora Ivey, taught the athletics. And they did a first-rate job in teaching athletics. Every girl was required to have physical education. 
and it was a well-rounded. If you couldn't play soccer, if you couldn't play tennis, well then you could do something else over here. They had archery. They had everything, and it was required of everyone. But they had excellent tennis players, they had excellent hockey players. Every girl, when she came into school, was assigned to one of the two sports clubs, Lambda or Kappa. And there was a great deal of rivalry, beautiful swimming, uh, aquacade they had, that uh, underwater synchronized swimming with light. It really was an elegant production. And they had the same in the modern dance. Phyllis Valente headed the modern dance. And her productions were simply superb. They really were. She, she did their own choreography. And uh, all of these people seemed to be able to pull from their students the very best that the student had. That's what impressed me, that they could take someone and uh, whatever they probably they could bring out the latent talents and develop them into the very fullest. Where was the swimming pool? I just oh, the swimming pool here. is still here. It's oh, down by it? the bookstore, where the bookstore is built around the bookstore. And, oh, incidentally, that was interesting. Every girl, of course, had to swim. Mm -hmm. they, that was a requirement. You couldn't leave the college unless you could swim. But they took swimming in the fall and the spring, outdoor. And they shivered, <laughs> but they went through it. They never they never gave in. They had to do that. So it was a good integra integrated uh, program, intellectually, academically, but with social activities. Mm -hmm. They developed the leadership abilities of the girls, and the athletic. It was a, a well-rounded program, yeah, very much so. Is there anything you would like to say to those who uh, might be viewing this tape? Uh, in the future? Well, yes, I would, because I think there's a tendency to always think of, well, we are better now than that we have been. And I know there are many buildings and uh, administrators are wont to always cite how many buildings, mm -hmm. how many students we have, and so forth. But I think the quality of education which this school has could not be measured, and I know this by being in education so long, and I knew people who were teaching in very well-known uh, schools like Sweetbriar and other women's colleges, and I think I really that our level of instruction was comparable to those. So I think that however big we become, whether we're university, and that doesn't impress me necessarily, because to me it's in name only, but uh, the college that we had here was a first-rate liberal arts school and prepared people for their various professions, not only to the very, but as good citizens, too. And I think they, they stress that in every way, that you're going, when you leave the college, whether you're a housewife, whether you're a professional person, working as a secretary, whatever, that we want you to be a good member of the community. And that was instilled in my life, which I think is essential to a good democracy. Thank you, Dr. Babard, for agreeing to be interviewed. Quite welcome.